There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Today, joining us on the show, Chad Lewis. It's been a while since he's been here. He's back with us now. Great to chat with him. He's a researcher, an author, and a lecturer on topics of the strange and unusual. His background is in psychology, and he did both his bachelor and master's degree work in that field. But for the last 20 years, he's traveled the globe in search of unique, and bizarre stories and histories. His new book due out in January, The Big Muddy Monster, Legends, Sightings, and Other Strange Encounters. Welcome to the show, Chad. Good to have you back. Hey, thanks for having me. So your world travels are taking you all over, meeting interesting people, talking to fascinating uh, individuals, and getting a chance to continue your journey researching the strange and unusual. I want to know, has there been a legend that you've gone to research? that you've gone out to meet and greet people and and kind of immerse yourself in that culture only to find out it is like the thinnest story and there's really nothing to it at all after all the hype and and, uh, hyperbole? Yeah, there there tends, as you know, there tends to be a lot of those where when you start to really dig into the legend, when you're looking for the meat and the bones of the case, what you start to find are a lot of of friend-of-friend stories a lot of folklore and legend, but not a lot of, not even real evidence, but any type of real sighting. And that happens a lot with hauntings, at least in in my experience, that some of these stories that they are simply just folklore and that when you try to find the origin, you find that they're at the, the best, super exaggerated. At the worst, they might just be completely made up. Yeah, that's always uh, a horrible aspect of this, right? You get in there, you really start digging deep, and and you can't find any historic relevance for any of the claims. Why do you think that, uh, you know, how does a story build like that when there is no history to link it to at all? I think in this, this era of the Internet and modern media and social media, legends can build in a very short amount of time. It used to be that a lot of these legends were regional. If you didn't live in that area, you might not have heard about the local legend, and it spread decade after decade after decade. And now, with a lot of Internet sites, you can post your experience at a site, and people will then claim it's haunted, and these stories just kind of move and progress and morph over the years without anyone actually investigating them. I worked for, I think it was about four or five seasons on the Ghost Adventures TV series as a location scout. And my job was to contact locations, hear their stories, try to get some of the real history of them, and then move forward from there to see if the guys were interested in investigating. And Chad, I can't even begin to tell you the amount of locations out there that as soon as I started pressing the point and I'd be like, all right. So you talk about the ghost of Jerry and the ghost of Mary and the ghost of Larry. Did Jerry, Mary, and Larry die there? Well, no, we have no accounts of a Jerry, Mary, or Larry ever having been here, but we've had psychics come through, and they give us the names, and they tell us what happened. And I'm like, that's all you have to hinge us on? Well, yeah. And you're like, so the entire haunting story started with somebody couldn't find their car keys and found them downstairs instead of where they thought they left them on the nightstand, you had psychics come in. They told you, these three characters live in this house. This is what they're doing. 
they told you how they died, but you can't find any connection in reality. Well, no, but they were able to give us the names. And right there, that's the birth of a lot of these legends, the mediums and psychics. And I'm not trying to put them down. <clears throat> we're good friends with quite a few. But in some cases, it's like, to me, if if somebody tells you something and you can't find any historical background to, to benefit or or corroborate their claims, it's pretty useless. Why do you think people are so quick to glom onto it? Is it just so that they can get their 15 minutes of fame? Well, I think you're perfectly accurate there. And I love using psychics or intuitives as one piece of the puzzle. And sometimes these people that I've used and encountered, they've told me things that would be very hard for them to know about places they didn't know we were going unless they did better research than I did. But on the other hand, there are other times I say you'd be better off bringing a piece of toast and asking that questions because <laughs> they're so far away. But I think you're right there that I've encountered that so many times as well that psychics giving information, nobody checking it out as one piece. Like it's great if psychics can give you names of people that actually died there or were associated with it. But I think it, it brings up a bigger point of paranormal tourism today that when I first did my original book uh, 20 years ago, we would go to haunted places and whether it was a and b a hotel, a restaurant, whatever it was, and the owners would say, don't put us in your book because if people find out we're haunted, nobody's going to come here. And then they said, go ahead, nobody's going to read your book anyway. And so we put them in the book, and now we're that's always that's, that's always comforting. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. I was just saying that's always that's comforting. Always comforting. <laughs> yeah, it is. It was really funny because those are the same people emailing and calling us now, saying, "Hey, you wouldn't believe how many people are coming here because they believe it's haunted." So I think a lot of these businesses have a financial incentive to promote the the legend, and I love it because for so many years. Places were not. They were afraid to focus on their bizarre history. So I think it's a, a double-edged sword there that it's great because people are finally seeing the fun and relevance of folklore in their history, but others are exploiting it. Exactly. I mean, there's so much to the popularity now because of all the paranormal TV shows. And, you know, I've joked around for a long time saying I'm always skeptical of a haunted location with a gift shop attached. But I've been to places that are haunted that have gift shops that are crazy haunted. I can't deny how active they've been when I've been there. So I've, I've had to get over that misnomer as well. But there is so much going on. You started doing these books 20 years ago. Are you kind of surprised by how many places now come forward claiming that they're haunted, but can actually support it with, you know, video activity, uh, electronic voice phenomena, strange photographs, above just the orb photographs, but things that really seem anomalous in nature? Yes, and I'm amazed at how many of these places remain silent for decades, that these are not places that all of a sudden had stuff happening. These are historic places where things had been happening for decades, but they simply did not promote it. They didn't talk about it unless you happen to stay there and inquire about it. Otherwise, they just either thought it would scare people away or that people really wouldn't be that interested. So I think you could do this 24 hours a day, every day of the year, and never run out of legitimate great places. Now, there seems to be a bit of a difference, if, and correct me if I'm wrong in your research, you know, many places for a long time kind of hid the fact that they're haunted. There are still hotels and businesses that will hide that fact, and they're telling me that they're afraid it'll affect their business, and I say, well, you might want to call the Stanley Hotel or the Queen Mary Hotel <laughs> or, you know, the Crescent Hotel, any myriad of, of uh, paranormal hotels, and ask them if it's negatively affected their business. Yes, they may have lost some of the people that would have normally come, but I guarantee you most of them have picked up tenfold what they were ever getting before. And it's strange, though. So some of those locations still don't want to be out there. They don't want that aspect of their business to be known. And I get that. I, I respect that. But the thing that I've seen you know, to notice through time, cryptid encounter locations, they seem to be much more hospitable, if you will, 
to uh, talking about their beasties and monsters and not hiding that that's part of their culture. Why do you think there's such a, a big breakdown when you have possible animal wildlife that is huge, scary, weird? You would think that would be the worst kind of PR for you to get people out and about and in that area. Uh, you know, but the ghost hotels and, and places want to hide that, but cryptid places are are. You know, they have signs up. They're gloating about it. They've got it everywhere. Why do you think there's this big difference in that through the years? I agree completely that cryptids and monsters, these towns and regions take full advantage of it and use it to draw in tourism more and more. Whereas, again, with haunted places, and I think partially that an entire community can claim a monster, a sea serpent, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, whatever it is. Whereas I think a a haunting may reflect on one person or several people, and we usually deem that with the owners or the workers of that place. Whereas in a big lake, the whole community can get involved. Nobody's really staking their reputation on the credibility of these sightings. And it's just seen as, I think for a lot of people, I don't want to say a cooler story or a a, a better or more fun story, but a different story. Whereas hauntings we often think of and associate with untimely deaths, suicides, murders, tragedies, serial killers, and the like. And that has a negative connotation to some of it in some people's minds. Whereas monsters, on the other hand, yes, vampire stories may be scary. You might hear of uh, the Beast of Bray Road charging a couple vehicles. But for the most part, I think people are fascinated by these monsters rather than scared or repulsed by them. You know, one thing that just kind of hit me after I asked that question, and and I've been in these situations where I've had people come to do live events with me at places like the Queen Mary or Stanley Hotel, and I think what the other part of the answer might be, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that there's a lake monster or a forest beast or whatever in this area. But they know that then you're going to go out there to look for it or you're going to go try to put yourself in that position. There's something more unnerving about being back in your room, getting ready to go to sleep and having your TV start turning on, the water running, toilets flushing on their own. And then, you you know, I've, I've gone to these events and I go out in the hall and there's people sitting up against the wall. And I'm like, what are you doing out in the hall? Well, I can't go back in there. There's things going on, and I'm like, well, that's awesome. That's what you came here for. And they're like, no. And they point to the rest of the hotel. They go, I want it out here, not in my room. So maybe it is just the intimacy of it being in your room, the possibility that there's a ghost there watching you while you're in the bathroom or or trying to sleep at night that's a little unnerving. (laughs) That's great. That's a great point because you can't escape. Right. (laughs) Here in the National Forest, the odds of this creature being near you are pretty slim, and then you can always get in your car and go home where you're right in a hotel or motel room or what be it. You're trapped. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's probably got a lot more to do with it as I, as I do think about that. It's fascinating, though, how people react. Now, I've heard a lot of cryptids over the years, and our listeners really like the strange when it comes to monsters. And all of a sudden, I'm drawn to this new book I hear called The Big Muddy Monster. What the hell is The Big Muddy Monster? I love this story because I get a lot of reports of monsters around the world, and a large percent of them are similar, interesting, but similar Bigfoot sightings of a, a hairy biped creature in the woods. And you they start to run together a little bit. So for me, when I'm interested in a, a new case or an old case that I had never heard of, I like it to be a little different, something that stands out. And I had always heard, you know, on the outskirts of my knowledge of the, the Big Muddy Monster, it's down in southern Illinois in a town called Murfreesboro, which is in southern, southern Illinois. If you lined it up, it's really on the southern portion of Missouri. So we're talking the south here. And it was a a giant Bigfoot-like monster, more white-furred, that started appearing and got huge notoriety in the 1970s. Most people think that that was the first sighting of the monster. And think of a seven-foot-tall, shaggy-furred, white or very light brown 
three to four inch hair covering its entire body, lower extremities of the body covered in mud from the big muddy river. And that the monster has been uh, sighted so many times over the years that people simply have no idea what it is. And that's really what got me interested in it is that so many people had seen it over the last hundred years and yet there's no explanation. All right. So now, not in that. yeah, the eyewitness accounts though, that you're seeing that, that you're reporting on, do they um, tend to come from what we would call more credible sources or are you running, running into a lot of drunk lovers who were hiding out, making out in the backseat of their car and saw something running past their car kind of story. What, what have you got in the way of, you know, uh, reported sightings through the years? That's funny you mention that because it's a little bit of both that the story really broke in 1973 when a couple of young people were at a park making out in their back seat and they spotted this creature, seven feet tall, horrible smell associated with it. And they simply uh, took off out of the area and went to the local police station and reported the monster. The police came back, checked out the area, smelled the terrible smell, saw giant footprints. And a lot of researchers over the years believe that this had to be a legitimate sighting because these two young people were both married at the time to other people while they were there at the park making wow. out. So, <laughs> so the common belief was that there's no way these two would risk uh, shining light on their affair if something had not terrified them, which we don't know. I mean, that's a, a common mistake is the false consensus uh, factor bias, the, the belief, the overestimating the belief that other people think and act like we do. Right. That we tend to think they're the same as us so that we would never go to the police department if we were having an affair because it would get the exposure. But we don't know what other people would do. So that's when most people think that it started. But what I found over the research is that these sightings were going on for much, much longer. And that's where the part where the credible witnesses come in, that you have police well, officers. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Let's reel it back to this this first one that really kind of kicked off the excitement for the story. You've got a man and a woman, both married to other people. They're making out in the car. They see this thing and smell this thing. They go directly to the police department. It, it, first of all, do you think it's interesting that the police took it credibly and went out to go investigate? And when they could smell this horrific smell and they found these large footprints, is there an official report on file regarding this case? <laughs> there is. And you're right that the police didn't just throw it off, throw it away as, okay, you guys have been drinking, you're crazy, obviously you're nervous. They actually took it with some credibility, and they went there, and it ended up being over four officers through the night came back with fellow witnesses. They saw Prince in the woods, and this park that the couple was parked in, sits right along the Big Muddy River. And the Big Muddy River got its name because it's big and it's muddy. You would not <laughs> want to swim in it. So no real originality in the name calling. That, that river's big and muddy. Let's call it the Big Muddy. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, again, this is, uh, you know, this is the 70s and it's the South and, and the like. But it's, it's certainly not a river you're going to go skinny dipping in because you'll come out covered as a mud monster. Right. Well, so the police go there, uh -huh. and one of the officers is so frightened at some noise he hears in the woods that he actually ends up dropping his gun in the mud. They leave, leaving the gun there. They have to come back to retrieve his weapon later because they were so frightened of what might be there. And they went there partially. When I interviewed several of the officers, they went there partially because they thought it might be something weird. But also they thought it might just be a known animal, maybe a bear wandered in or something that might be harmful to the community. So they went there as a precaution as maybe it was something, a known animal. All right. That says something even more that, first of all, a cop dropped his weapon. We don't know what's out there. And I think it's interesting that they were more intrigued by the fact that it could be just a known monster, a known animal 
appearing to look monstrous. Maybe it is covered in mud, or it's like we found recently, bears with mange can look incredibly frightening and weird, um, you know, from the reports and photographs. And for our listeners, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just type in bear with mange and look online. You will find pictures. Uh, it is, yeah, don't look up hairless and bear because you'll get totally different types of pictures at that point. But <laughs> <laughs> but if you uh, look up the bear with mange, you'll see what we're talking about. I would be more on the line of how do we know we're not just dealing with some dirty homeless person uh, that's out there, you know, living around in, in that area, especially in the South. There's a lot of people that do live very rough and, and uh, live in kind of environments that Chad, you and I might not find so pleasant or uh, hospitable. If you're ever bored on a Saturday afternoon, go down to your local library and start digging through the old newspaper archives from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they're filled with these people that want to live as today we would consider off the grid, that they may, they might be the original hipsters of the time that <laughs> They, they lived, they were unkept, they were said to have long whiskers, some people called them wild men, there's a lot of debate whether they were Bigfoot creatures or just people that really didn't want to communicate with society, and a lot of them were captured with long hair and long beards and the, and the like, so that's a possibility. We also have to keep in the possibility that it was a hoax. Several people have come forward claiming that they either know the original hoaxers or that they were the original hoaxers of that first sighting in the Riverside Park there. And right. I always find so – what? Find see, real quick, I, I just want to stop you. That's, that's what freaks me out more is that a cop dropped a weapon, and it wasn't one single cop out there by himself. There were other cops with him. He dropped his weapon, and they, they went back later. If, if it could have been somebody that was hoaxing – or some homeless guy out there, and you've just now left your service pistol, that seems like, you know, that that makes this a little bit more credible to me that they were that unnerved by the situation at the time that that didn't even worry them. They just wanted to get the hell out of that area. That's a very intriguing aspect of the story because knowing police officers as I do, I can't think of one cop that would drop a gun, leave it, and then just come back to try to retrieve it later. I agree completely, and it also shows that a lot of these sightings of these cryptids mostly, they a lot of time come with this overwhelming sense of fear for some unknown reason, even irrational fear that I've had people see these things on the side of the road at night while they're driving in their big SUV, they slowed down, they're perfectly safe in their car, nothing's going to get them, but yet... They have an overwhelming urge to get out of the area because they feel that if they don't, this thing's going to try to kill them. And then when they get home and calm down, they're a little shy and embarrassed to report it. But they say at that that moment, they're just overcome like they've walked into a zone of fear. And that seems to be what happened with this officer when he dropped his weapon and simply decided to depart the area rather than retrieve it. Yeah, that that's an intriguing aspect of the story. All right, so now we've got the the cops going out there investigating it. They get so unnerved, one drops his gun. They have to come back for it later. Then you said that there's been people that have come forward to admit that they were part of the hoax. What can they do to back up their aspect? Because I'll tell you, one of the strangest stories, right, and, and I think you and I can still agree, is the Patterson-Gimlin film. Yes. Right. The very famous 1967 film of Bigfoot walking from the creek bed into the woods. There has been so much debate about that. Then you have a guy step forward. Well, two guys step forward. You've got uh, Bob Hieronymus and you've got um, Philip Morris, the costume maker, that step forward and say, we created this costume. Hieronymus wore this costume. And there are special effects experts that look at the costume and say, there's no way because we couldn't create something that good back in 1966-67. And when Bob Hieronymus and um, Philip Morris were tasked with recreating the costume, I think about 15 years ago, with current materials and better quality costuming, they couldn't come up with anything even remotely close. Why would you invest yourself into a story to debunk it or to say you were part of the original hoax? To me, that's almost as fascinating 
as the story itself. If these people are coming forward and suddenly there's multiple people coming forward, that's isn't that a bizarre aspect of this whole cryptid history? It is. One of the previous books I did is on a creature called Peppy. It's a lake monster on the Mississippi River on a big lake on the river called Lake Pepin. And when the book came out, I was contacted by half a dozen people who claimed that they started the legend of Pepe in the 1980s to get tourists to come to the lake, that whether they were out there trying to hoax people or spreading the stories. And I found that fascinating because I had tracked back newspaper accounts, many of them dating back to the 1800s about this monster. So maybe these people were hoaxing it, but they certainly weren't the origin of it. This thing had been around, this story had been around for much longer than they had even known. But in the case of the Big Muddy Monster, I talked to a woman who said that her father actually carved out the big footprints from from some plywood in his garage, and that for years she and her siblings would play with those cutouts years later like a toy. And, of course, when I asked where they were, if I could see them, uh, they had lost track of them. They no longer had them. I talked to one gentleman who believed that his buddy was the original hoaxer in 73 of the Big Muddy Monster as well, that he created this big suit and had a skunk-type spray that he sprayed on the suit with a couple buddies. And when I tried to find that suit or any evidence, there was none. So that's very uh, disheartening, I think, when people come forward with a, a hoax story, but yet they have no more evidence than the original story. Right, and you would think that if you created the hoax, you and your buddies would have taken photographs of you with the costume at some point, or wearing the costume, or something along those lines. I know we would in today's society. People's egos and need to take photographs of everything, Chad, would lead you to believe that we will eventually find those hoaxes coming forward. But it is still kind of amazing to me that nobody that claims to have done this can provide any proof. And it almost bolsters the case, in my opinion, when Philip uh, Morris and Hieronymus came forward making these claims and then couldn't substantiate one of them other than just saying, I was there and I wore a costume, but we can't re- we can't show you the costume, we can't reproduce the costume, we can't do anything. To me, that made the original sighting even more credible to me. I agree. And again, it, it goes back to the idea that we don't know why people do what they do. We don't know their motivation. We don't know why they would come forward and say they hoax something that they didn't. And we have to take it, I think, as the same grain of salt as any witness, that we have to try to look at the evidence and sort back from fiction. But I find it fascinating that, especially with this case, that I'm dealing with several people who all claim they were the original hoaxer of it. So maybe it was on this one night back in 73 in the summer, several different people, unbeknownst to one another, decide to hoax this creature all at the same time. And and again, I think it adds, as you said, to the credibility of the actual sightings because sometimes the hoax story is more bizarre than the actual story. No no doubt about it. Have you have you brought to the attention to these other quote unquote hoaxers the fact that that's interesting because I've got six more people claiming to be the exact same thing and they were the ones hoaxing this. How do they respond when you confront them with that knowledge? It's it's more of well that's wonderful. I don't know what to tell you about that. I can only tell you what I did or the information that I have. Maybe these other people are mistaken or lying. So. They don't believe the other people, but they believe their own story. (laughs) And once this story broke in uh, the Big Muddy, the the town of Murfreesboro became a circus. Hundreds of researchers and hunters and local regional trappers and big game men came to Murfreesboro looking to hunt this monster. And it was spotted several more times out in the woods while there were hundreds of people there. And my thought has always been that if you hoaxed it, that's great. You're probably at home. You're not going back out with hundreds of armed people in the woods 
in a suit looking to get shot at by these these posses, if you will. And keep in mind, in the 70s in southern Illinois, people were armed. In fact, when I was there originally a few years back interviewing many of the witnesses and police officers that were there at the time, the overwhelming majority of people I interviewed were armed while I interviewed them. And today, they were armed. So you can imagine in the 70s, it was a circus. The police officers said they had a lot of trouble, people walking around with tranquilizer guns in Murfreesboro looking to shoot at any shadow in the woods. Yeah, that's, you know, and I I get a kick sometimes out of, and skeptics are an important part of our business, Chad, and we're skeptical believers. But I find it funny when we talk about, like, newer things like the the black-eyed kids phenomena. How how many people will come to you and say, well, it's obviously kids with those blackout contact lenses. And I say, in this day and age, first of all, what parent in their right mind is going to let their 10 and 11 and 12-year-old kids out at 11, 12 o'clock at night with blackout eye contacts in to perpetrate a hoax? Well, do you think the kids would really do? Well, somebody had to buy those expensive sclera contacts for them. So they had to be, in, and most of them are in the case of almost... $169 a pair for those blackout contacts. Second of all, we're living in a culture now of conceal and carry. And I don't know about you, Chad, but if I'm out and about by myself and I've got a weapon on me and three creepy kids with black eyes start following me through the uh, through the area saying, come with us, we want to play with you, there's going to be three less children, black-eyed kids or not, in this world <laughs> before I leave that park. Who would be dumb enough in this day and age, to go out there and do these kind of things. And I think one of the, the, I think one of the things people talk about with the black eyed children and other stories is that they always throw out the, well, I never heard of that before. It's a new phenomenon as though these things can't exist unless they've existed for hundreds or thousands of years that, when you're looking at the weird, what is too weird? Where do you draw that line? <laughs> because if you draw that line, you're certainly not going to investigate sightings of chupacabras or um, even vampire stories, werewolves, witches. I mean, what's too weird when you're looking at the weird? So I think some of the skeptics about black-eyed children, especially claiming that, well, I hadn't heard of this 30 years ago, that doesn't mean that it's not real. Maybe these things are are happening and slowly growing over the years. We don't know, but I always feel that unless a case has had decades and decades and decades of sightings and research, a lot of people don't give it credibility. Where, uh, again, when you're dealing with the weird, I hate to say it, but what is too weird? Right. (laughs) And what is credibility? You know, I mean, there are police officers who we see will uh, lie about their own intentions on crimes. So we automatically assume when a police officer says that something happened, it becomes a more credible witness. And I'm not putting down law enforcement, Chad. I hope you understand that and our listeners. But I'm just saying there's nobody above the bar of shenanigans, right? Everybody's capable of fibbing to get some attention. And we fall victim to that, especially with looking at witnesses that we do think of trained observers like police officers, firefighters, pilots. We think of them as being trained observers. So if they have a sighting, it must have actually happened. And again, I think you're right that no one is above uh, lying or seeking attention or hoaxing or simply having a misidentification that they may truly believe they've seen something weird when, in fact, it might be something a little more normal. Right. And, and yeah, we've all had that weird experience at one point in our life or another where we think something's happened and we find out later it was nothing like that. We get a lot of those great stories, too, where people think there's a ghost, the door from outside starts rattling, they can't see out there. What they didn't know is later when they checked the night vision is that they've got a raccoon who's come up to the door and reached up and is shaking the handle trying to get in so it can get some food. And, and to them, they look out the window, there's nothing there, but they're not looking down. So, yeah, we all uh, can can be um, easily tricked on that aspect as well. But So this big muddy monster, 
I, I want to continue talking about this because I find it a fascinating new version of the story of, of like a Bigfoot like creature out there. Uh, Chad Lewis is our guest today and the book, it uh, will be out in January called The Big Muddy Monster, Legends, Sightings and Other Strange Encounters. If you go right now to darknessradio.com and click on our Killer Deals link, you'll be able to find a few of Chad's other books that we put in. But as soon as this book becomes available, we will put a link up for that as well so that you can obtain a copy. So keep checking back on a regular basis to darknessradio.com under the Killer Deals link. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We've got more of the best in paranormal talk radio coming your way right here on Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the darkness. You're back with the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. My guest today is Chad Lewis. His new book coming out in January, The Big Muddy Monster, Legends, Sightings, and Other Strange Encounters. You know, Chad, what's always fascinating to me about these legends and lore is that Bigfoot at least makes some sense because we know that there are animals that are very proficient at remaining hidden and unseen, but we know they exist. We see them fleetingly from time to time. And Bigfoot, at least, his coloring seems to match his surroundings. However, with the big muddy monster being more like a white kind of hairy, this thing's, this seems like something that would stand out like a sore thumb and would be seen and, and witnessed much more than currently uh we would accept right or or has it been witnessed so many times because it's so white what what do you believe you would think that it would blend into its surroundings its environment that it would be a darker color but almost all the sightings talk about it being a white or extremely light brown in color and i use that it probably fits into the category of a bigfoot but loosely that its shape, its head is pointed more like a cone from some people's observations. And many people have claimed that it has glowing red or green eyes, that it doesn't reflect light, but it originates light, that they see light blazing from the eyes, which again mm-hmm. sets it apart from other Bigfoot type creatures. So on the one hand, it does seem to be very similar to some known cryptids that we have. But it's just a bit off that it has its own uniqueness as well. Well, I was wondering about this aspect of it. If it appears kind of white, kind of chalky, and it's near the big muddy, could it be a cooling mechanism for these creatures? Um, You know, we know dogs do not sweat, right? They sweat through their panting and through their tongue. Could this creature, could this Bigfoot offshoot perhaps doesn't sweat as well? And because it's in the south... Maybe the mud and and rolling in the mud, which gives it that white features, maybe that's a cooling mechanism for it, is packing itself in mud, and then sometimes it'll rinse it off and it's it's darker and can be you know easier to adapt. Maybe they're just catching it from time to time after it's gone for a mud bath, and I don't mean that to sound silly or ridiculous, but I wonder if that's uh has that ever been considered in in the research for this beast? We have to look at, because we really know little about the these monsters or these beasts, animals, whatever you want to call them. We don't know if they mate or what they eat, if they migrate. Any of that is really relatively unknown. So it is possible that it cakes itself in mud for heat. It may bathe in the, the water to cool itself down. It may cake itself with mud for the insects they have there as well. If you've ever oh, been oh, yeah, here that's a great thought. The summer, you know that it's terrible. And if you're living in the woods, not just camping there, 
you might want that protection as well. So we don't know. I mean, it's all speculation at this point. Well, Chad, maybe we, someday we will know. We have to guess, Chad, that they do mate because <laughs> they're not just yeah. hatching out of eggs that have been dropped from the sky. So obviously there's some kind of ritual going on. And again, maybe this is part of the mating ritual. Maybe this is its plumage. It, it rolls in the mud to get the attention or maybe even to kill the smell of itself as it's stalking other animals as prey to eat. Have there been any remains found of deer or other big animals like there are in many Bigfoot cases where it appears something has been eating off of it that doesn't, you know, match the normal creatures that are in that area. We don't have any known carcasses or mutilations or anything that could be explained on a big predator. We do have in 1970s, uh, they were having a carnival in Murfreesboro where some of the carnival workers reported seeing this giant seven foot tall white furred monster over by some of the ponies that they were using for the rides. And they said it was uh, making the ponies act very, very strange and startled them as though something was spooking them, but it did not attack. The workers said it just kind of looked at the creatures in a curious type manner as though it had never seen them before. And then it scurried back off into the woods. And if we are dealing with a creature that's been intelligent enough to avoid detection for at least a 100 years, maybe more, they might be better at covering their tracks. And again, we don't know if they eat animals or if, what they eat. But again, back to your point that they must breed, and that would mean that there must be at least some type of breeding population so that maybe people are not seeing the same gender of these creatures, or maybe they're seeing the offspring, which we know in nature a lot of offspring change their color of their fur or feathers as they get older. So that's one aspect we may have to look at, too. It's it's so fascinating. I love this kind of work. And as you're researching this and hearing these stories, talking to these people, um, do you get a feel... How often, I, I guess I should say, how often do you get a feeling that who you're talking to is a complete bullshit artist as opposed to somebody who really believes they had a sighting? For me and the thousands of people I've interviewed over the last 20-some years, the overwhelming majority of people I talk with mm -hmm. are rational, logical, sincere, down-to-earth, intelligent people that have had something they can't explain happen to them. And when you deal, as you know, um, getting all your callers for so many years, thousands of them, that you start to learn when somebody, you start to pick up on things that you can kind of, I don't want to say it's a bullshit detector, but you can, as, can I say that on the show? I did. Why can't you? All right. Well, you're the host. <laughs> now, as you know, you start to feel things that don't quite sit right with a lot of witnesses. But for me, the vast, vast, vast majority of people that I contact are not out looking to hoax me. They're not out looking to sell their story to a book or a TV show. They simply have had something happen that they can't explain. Let's hear about some of the other encounters that you collected for this book. I'm, I'm fascinated. We've really only covered the one so far with the couples, uh, you know, the, the married cheating couple that turned, uh, turned themselves and the story in. What are some of the other more compelling stories that you've been able to uh, acquire for this? One of my favorite stories, and it might be one of my favorite Bigfoot-esque type stories, happened in the summer of 1988, and the setting for this story is something out of a, a B-level horror movie out of Hollywood. Imagine a junkyard on the outskirts of town and a junkyard in the 1980s before we cleaned them up a little bit. So this is a sprawling junkyard, heaps of rotting metal, decom, you know, rusting things everywhere. And the owner of this junkyard had heard a lot of rustling in his junkyard late at night and believing that it was teenagers coming in to steal parts or take radios out of the cars, he hired one of his buddies to work as a night security guard. And even though this buddy of his was a police officer, they still came up with the plan that if this person, the security guard, noticed anything odd at night, 
that he would immediately call Bob, the owner, and they would approach the disturbance together for safety. And one night, about 1.30 a.m., the security guard noticed something making noise in the back of the salvage yard. So he went back and called his buddy. They went back there to look together, and that's where they saw this big, giant creature standing at the back of their salvage yard, darting back and forth as though it was hiding behind some of the vehicles. They said it was about seven to eight feet tall, huge. What I love about this story is that immediately the security guard pulled out his 357 Smith & Wesson and asked his boss, should I shoot this monster? And the salvage owner, Bob, had enough sense to say, we don't know anything about this creature. If you shoot it, it may just make it mad. So instead, they decided to retreat. (laughs) They decided to go back to their um, base office, which was a huge garage, a big metal shed. So they start walking back. They have flashlights. They're armed. And this thing's following them. And they said it was just remaining on the outskirts of where they could get a good look at it, as though it knew that if it came any closer, it would reveal itself. And they actually tried to run it past a motion light on one of the buildings, but this thing ducked away as though it sensed there was a motion light there. That's unbelievable. Weird, creepy, unbelievable. It gets more terrifying for these two because they go back. Good. I love when it gets scarier for them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They go back to their shed and they start calling some family members. They're pretty spooked. They don't want to call the police because they're afraid of what would come from that and not in terms of what they might discover, but all the ridicule and joking that they might receive, especially since one of them was a police officer. Right. So they go back to their shed. They're sitting in the shed. The family arrives, and the family actually brings rolls of toilet paper with them because they think they're being hoaxed, that they think uh, somebody is you know, playing a trick on them, their family. They don't believe it. They think they're telling a tale. So the family is all now gathered in the shed. All right, wait a minute. I, <laughs> they came armed with rolls of toilet paper? Again, pardon my language, but they thought their family was bullshitting them. Right. (laughs) So they came with toilet paper, not as a defense, but kind of like, here you go. If you're going to tell these, uh, spin these yarns, you better use this. I got you. All right. (laughs) It's just the way you posed it at first. They came armed with toilet paper. I'm like, boy, these are some pacifistic monster chasers. That's all I got to (laughs) say. Yeah, you would think, yeah, you would, maybe it's a new trend. Maybe these monsters are afraid of toilet paper. I TP to Bigfoot. I, I want to get a T-shirt that says that. I TP to Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> so the family starts listening to the two men's story that this creature they believe now is 8 to 10 feet tall. It was covered with extremely long hair, and it had a silver tinge to the hair. That The hair was 3 to 4 inches long, and the upper torso, which is this is weird, The upper torso seemed to be heavily groomed and very nice where the bottom was all matted and knotted down and covered in mud. And again, it might be a grooming thing. But as they're talking about what they saw and the family doesn't believe them, they start to hear something rustling outside, something big outside of their shed. And then something starts hitting the door. They believed it was something throwing rocks at the door from far away. Now the family's huddled together. They're afraid. They're terrified. And this thing's getting louder, the rocks or whatever, to the point where Bob believed that the creature was actually banging on their door. And he believed that it was done not in an aggressive moment because He believed that whatever he saw could have easily smashed right through the door had it wanted. But it was simply banging on the door almost to terrorize them. And then it darted back off into the woods, and the family peeked their head out to the door cautiously and then simply ran to their car and drove off. They got out of there as fast as they could. The next day... (laughs) Maybe he was just looking for a roll of toilet paper. He was tired of leaves. (laughs) 
again, we have no idea. This is all, you know, it's fun to speculate and we have to because, because we have no solid evidence. Right. We have to come up and try to come up with some theories. And the next day they did find gigantic 16 inch footprints along the mud on the outskirts and this, the gentleman, Bob, he didn't want to talk about the case at all. Um, he happened to be mentioning it at a restaurant, a truck stop with one of his buddies, and there was a news reporter sitting in the booth next to him, overheard the story, and then broke the news, and media from all over the world descended again upon Murfreesboro looking for this monster. And people came with cages and again with trank darts and weapons to try to capture this monster that had, since the original sightings of the 70s, it kind of faded from view. People were just starting to forget about it when this new crazy story broke. That is unbelievable. Uh, did So they find these big 16-inch footprints. And now, are there photographs of any of these footprints or anything that remained? Did anybody think to do plaster castings, anything that we can review? We've been trying to track down the investigators that showed up there in 88. Apparently, there were some plaster casts that were taken of the footprints, some up to 18 inches, some 14 inches in length and 4 inches wide, which would make it uh, pretty big. We do know there are footprints from the police of the original footprints in the 1973 sighting when they occurred. They did snap some photographs of those. But no fur was found, no droppings, uh, nothing else that would indicate something was there. That's interesting. All right, give us uh, give us a couple more of your your best examples of some of the encounters that took place regarding the big muddy monster. What I love are the stories where people have something happen that they're not expecting. They're not out there looking for monsters. They're not on a Bigfoot expedition. These things just simply uh, happen. And that was one case where a gentleman was jogging, and this predates some of the known cases of the 73 case of 1972. A man was out jogging uh, by the Ohio River levee, and he actually saw a 10-foot hairy white beast swimming in the water, and then it got out, and it was walking on two legs, as most witnesses reported. It is a biped walking upright on this hind legs like you and I do. And it saw this jogger, looked at it, the thing noticed the jogger, and the jogger simply scurried back off on the trail to get away from this monster. And that, again, leads itself to or lends itself to the overcome with fear that you would think that if you were out and you saw this new monster, new species, whatever it was, that you'd be fixated on it, that you would stop and watch it as long as you could. But that's the exact opposite of some of these witnesses that instead they simply try to scurry away and get away from these creatures. I don't blame them for that. I mean, good God, what would you do if you saw something that big, Chad? You're out there investigating. And let me ask you, as I've asked many of the other cryptid researchers and investigators, what is your game plan if you go out there and you run into one of these, Chad? That has been uh, a topic of great debate on a lot of our <laughs> expeditions of what we would do. We, uh, you know, the fight or flight response again. And there's uh, a lot of debate, as you know, in the community about whether you try to attack or kill these beasts or simply try to document them. And it's really one of those you can have a game plan of going over almost as though you're making an escape plan for your family for a fire in case of a fire or disaster. You can do the same thing with the paranormal, that you can go over in your mind the actions that you will do when you see something. And for me, the overwhelming thing would be to try to document something. But I can give you an example. We were up uh, near Bemidji, Minnesota, just east of there is a small little place called Star Lake and Star Island. And in the island is a lake called Windigo Lake. And it was thought to be haunted or cursed or inhabited by the giant Windigo, the Native American cannibalistic spirit. And 
While we were there on this nearly deserted winter island, camping 25 below weather, we kept a pot of hot tallow on the fire at all times. Not because it kept us warm, but because one of the main ways to kill a Wendigo is the outside of cutting out its icy heart is to pour hot tallow down its throat and it will defrost the icy heart and it will die. So we had this hot tallow on our fire at our camp the entire expedition. Not that we were going to use it, but I think psychologically there's something comforting about following the old folklore procedures of having it at hand. That right, even if but, you're on but, these things with a gun, you may not use them. How do you... Uh... Who's going to hold him down while the other one shoves the tallow down his throat? <laughs> exactly. Again, these make no sense. Uh, another way of killing the Wendigo, of course, is using silver, whether it's a silver bullet or a silver sword, whatever you use, which when you're talking about the native peoples of the 1600s in Canada and northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, the French explorers that came through, the last thing they're going to have on them is a giant silver uh, sword. You know, that seems like the least likely of things that would kill this this monster. So not only am I fascinated by how folklore of the monsters and creatures themselves, but also that surrounding folklore of how to ward them off, how to attract them, how to kill them, how to destroy them. I'm just as fascinated about how these things spring up as I am about the original folklore. No, I agree with you. That is uh, that is equally bizarre. All right. Uh, when talking about the Wendigo, that's something, you know, I remember the first time I heard about the Wendigo was reading uh, Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. And that is still one of the only books I can honestly sk- say scared the living hell out of me, uh, every aspect of it. And the Wendigo being this kind of Native American creature, is it kind of like a cross between an, an elemental and a Bigfoot? Is that what we know about the uh, the Wendigo? That's a really great explanation or description of it. What we know is that, well, reports vary. There are two types of Wendigo, if you will. One, a flesh and blood type Wendigo. And some people say that it's anywhere from 8 to 30 feet tall. That it, uh, original reports of it is very similar to the Big Money, where it's white-skinned, white-furred, or white-clothed. It always appeared to be white. But then, not only do you have this monster, which some stories are that it used to be a human being, that during a harsh Canadian or northern Minnesota winter resorted to cannibalism and then was then forced to walk the earth as this hideous monster hell-bent on consuming human flesh. Others say that you can actually be possessed by the Wendigo. And we have numerous accounts of native tribes back in Canada in the 16, 17, 1800s, murdering their own fellow tribes people because they believed that they were possessed by the Wendigo. And when uh, the white pioneers arrested these native people, the native people told them that if they would not have killed that person, the Wendigo would have spread and infected everybody in the tribe and they would all be dead. So it was thought that if you were possessed by the Wendigo, you had to be killed. And amazingly, those who believed they were possessed by the Wendigo, they were begging to be killed so they did not turn because they started looking at their fellow tribespeople as animals. They would see them as a fat beaver and want to eat them, which brings in the cannibalistic aspect to it as well. It sounds like that old Looney Tunes cartoon with the two guys stuck on the island too long, and they start looking at each other like a sausage or a giant T-bone steak. There are so many reports of people consuming their entire family up in Canada during the harsh winters, and they believed that they were infected by the Wendigo, that they had gone Wendigo. And that was a fear that was spread not only among the native peoples there, the First Nation people, but also by the French and the pioneers and the explorers and the missionaries that came over. And although we consider this a Native American or American Indian and First Nations people legend, it has also been brewing in, you know, Caucasian uh, explorers for over 400 years as well. 
I didn't know that. Boy, there's so much to to these creature legends. You have to think that there's more to it than just uh, misidentification of psychology of of crypt of actual cryptids or uh you know actual animals known beasts it's it's fascinating are there when we talk about the the big muddy monster are there many stories of him being overly aggressive not that have been reported on there might be out there and as you know the overwhelming majority of people who experience something like this they never officially report it so that we know there are a lot of sightings of the big muddy monster. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of them. We think there may be as many as a hundred others that have never been reported because again, most people, one, they don't know who to report it to and they'd rather not go through all that trouble of reporting it and not knowing the ramifications of that. So we don't have any where it seems to threaten or attack or even uh, harm witnesses. It seems to be more intent on returning to the bush undiscovered than it is about actually attacking people. All right. The idea, too, that we've got these creatures roaming all over the United States and around the world in different parts, and there's still no body. There's still no conclusive evidence. How does that affect you as an investigator and a researcher? Do do you ever kind of get the feeling that, yeah, maybe it's time to start you know, looking into something else, or or does the it is it not so much the the omelet that intrigues you, but the making of it? It's the stories, it's the it's the people that you meet, and the you know, it's all of a sudden I'm going to do Sesame Street. It's the people that you meet <laughs> each day, right? Um, what what about this keeps your drive and excitement in this field? If you start out in this field, if any of your listeners are out there wanting to start investigating with the idea that you're going to come into the field and solve a lot of mysteries and uh, find definitive proof of a lot of these stories, you're going to burn out very quickly. And you probably know this as well as I do, that a lot of our colleagues have burned out over the years because oftentimes it's frustrating having these legends and sometimes feeling no closer than the day you started investigating them. And I've been doing this 20 plus years. And then I talk with some of my colleagues. I recently uh, had a dinner with uh, Jerome Clark, who's uh, a pioneer in the field of paranormal, especially UFOs and the like. And he's been doing it 40 plus years. And when you hear him tell that he's no closer to answers than he was 40 years ago, and you're thinking, I have two more decades to do this, that you have to, at least in my opinion, you have to shift gears from, I'm going to solve all these mysteries, and if you do, it's great, but I think you hit it on the head that you have to see this as an adventure. I'm going to go out, chase these stories, capture the folklore, invent- interview witnesses, have adventures, and if you do it like that, I think you'll last a lot longer in the field, at least from my experience. I have wondered how many of these type of encounters, Chad, are nothing more than misidentified homeless people. Because you hear about the fact that people will leave food out for them, then they start coming around on a regular basis. They will get these faraway glances, and I don't know if you've ever seen, well, shoot, think about this. Look at um, look at the scene from Forrest Gump. When Forrest starts running across the country. Now, yes, Dave, it's just a movie. But people look like that. You grow that hair out. You grow that beard and mustache out, right? And you're maybe dirty. You're living off the land. You're living out in the woods, which we know there are people out there doing. How do we know that we're just not misidentifying it for the homeless population? Is there ever any work done or research done in these locations for you know, individual encampments that are usually found out near these uh, Bigfoot encounters as well. I don't know anyone who's doing or who has run into others in the area. But when you're talking about private land, you also have to keep in mind that many sightings happen on uh, national or state land or local land, which if you were looking for a place to live, you would probably pick one of those over somebody's private land. Um, Also, maybe you're looking at Bigfoot nests as being encampments. That could be a possibility. 
But I think it also speaks to the fact that you had mentioned earlier about never finding a body of a, a, a Bigfoot. If thousands of people are seeing them, you would think that they would have captured a body or some type of definitive proof. And I think a lot of researchers that I've been talking with over the last decade or so have really shifted gears from believing that these are flesh and blood type creatures, just some unknown species roaming the earth, to something else. And whether they believe it's a tulpa, a thought being, or an ultra terrestrial, or something completely unknown that we don't even have a name for, I think many researchers are shifting from not just looking at it as being something that you could trap or hunt that may be something more supernatural in nature. Where do you come down on that? I know a lot of people, including myself, have that kind of belief system. What do you think that people are dealing with? Do you believe them to be more interdimensional, or do you believe it to be more misidentified creatures and people? After 20-plus years of doing this, I'm left with more questions than answers. What I would say is if I had to choose right now, I would think that it was not a flesh-and-blood animal. I don't know. But based on my research, I would have to put it in a different category, whether that is interdimensional, time beings, um, ultra terrestrials, you know, tulpas I've, I've struggled with as well. And again, for anyone not knowing what a tulpa is, it's really a thought being that if so many people believe in something, it actually creates it and it comes to life. And one of the drawbacks I have with that is that why are we not seeing Santa Claus then? Because more people believe in Santa Claus, kids, than probably Bigfoot. Or well, What are you talking about, Chad? I, I see Santa all the time. Every time I go to the mall, every time I go past a uh, a store, there's always a sign that Santa's going to be there for breakfast. He's not hidden so much. Come on, man. Don't lump Santa in with the cryptid beings. That's true. He has come out lately, uh, recently. He's doing more events. Now, I, those, those bastard reindeers of his that fly and have glowing red noses, now those fit into the category. <laughs> Plus, I just saw Krampus on December 5th this year, so uh, yeah, Whoa. maybe you're right there. It's not good if you saw Krampus. You realize that, Chad. There's <laughs> yeah. no gifts coming for you this year, my friend. And what I love about some of these stories, again, back to like the Wendigo or the, the Hellhounds or others, is that a lot of communities and um, uh, regions of the world believe that these things are harbingers of death that they are a death omen, that much like hearing the Irish Banshee, if you see this Wendigo or Hellhound or uh, Cadejos down in uh, Central America, that it means you or someone you know is going to die very shortly. So you're right that a lot of people do not want to see these things. Well, but you also don't want to see Krampus because usually he's the enforcer for Santa, and if Krampus is knocking on your door, it's not going to be good for you. You don't want Krampus coming in, although at this point, you know, again, I'm hoping I'm big enough to avoid his basket on the back of his, uh, of his bucket <laughs> where he takes me away. But still, it, again, it, it, it's be careful what you wish for, that a lot of communities that avoid these things, they believe that when you go looking for the weird, the weird comes looking for you, that they refuse to even talk about or mere mention of some of these these creatures that – if you're in some communities, you won't even say the name Wendigo when you're talking about the beast because that's enough for them to put you on their radar. Same with the little people, the hidden people, you know, the gnomes, leprechauns, goblins, what be it, that it's often thought that when you go look for them, you need to bring an offering with you, whether it's some chocolate, tobacco, a shiny rock, something to leave so they will not curse you. A shiny rock, huh? That'd be enough to get you out of trouble? Yeah, it seems to be. Now, when I was over in Ireland, I would walk into a pub and say, where do all the gnomes and goblins hang out? And they would say, which ones do you want to know about? Whereas if you try doing that here in the United States, you'll probably get kicked out of the pub <laughs> thinking you're already intoxicated. But or, or, again, they'll just, believed, or they'll just point to the end of the bar where the oldest drunks are sitting and go, they're right there. <laughs> yeah, that might be right. And, you know, they believe that these things can take your sight, your hearing, your life, that many of them have supernatural powers, which, again, brings us back to maybe these things aren't flesh and blood, especially uh, some of the, the weirder ones. 
Well, Chad, I, I want to thank you very much for stopping in and sharing some information on your new book. We wish you a lot of success with the uh, the book, which will be coming out in January, The Big Muddy Monster Legends, Sightings, and Other Strange Encounters. We'll put a link up to that again. Just go to darknessradio.com. Click on the Killer Deals link. It'll take you right into our Amazon page. And we have a few of his other books up and posted right now. And then you'll be able to find the new book as soon as it is available. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Chad. Thank you for joining us. And we'll have to have you back to talk some creepy ghost stories uh, the next time we visit. Would that be all right? Keep an eye out. All right. Take care, sir. And that's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow. We've got more of the best in paranormal talk radio coming your way here on Beyond the Darkness.